Welcome to USA Football's Coach and Coordinator Podcast, where top football coaches from around the country share their stories, philosophies, concepts, and strategies to help you get better on and off the field. Now, here's your host, Keith Grabowski. Hey, coaches, before we get going today, I just wanted to thank you for all you've been doing to support this podcast. And we have an incredible lineup coming up here. Uh, We have just about every major college conference represented. We have a ton of FBS coaches, Division II coaches, Division III coaches, some great high school football coaches coming on the podcast to share with you and help you grow professionally during this time. I really appreciate all of you asking your questions on Twitter. Please follow me at Coach K Grabowski for our daily updates on our guests and your opportunity to ask questions. We will read them on the show and attribute those to you. Um, So please contribute to the show as much as you can. I also want to talk to you a little bit about our football development model, which is something we've rolled out here at USA Football. And this is really for you to uh, be able to help your youth football programs develop. It's about a long-term athlete development plan and something that comes off of the American development model, which is something that the USOC has put together. The idea is that we're able to teach skills in a progression starting at the youngest ages. We're also looking at the different game types we have, whether that's flag, which is non-contact, limited contact games like padded flag or tackle bar and full contact and the right progressions for contact teaching there as well. Be sure to check out all we do at footballdevelopment.com and check out what we're doing with the FDM, the football development model, at usafootball.com backslash fdm.usafootball.com. Hello, coaches, and welcome to the Home Team Podcast, where football coaches from around the country provide the coaching community with improvements for their game plans for winning as a husband and a father. Today, I have the honor of speaking to Coach Thomas Hammock, the head coach at the University of Northern Illinois. Coach Hammock and I actually connected a long time ago. He joined the Wisconsin football team as a graduate assistant 2003 and 2004, and that was right around the time I was a junior in college. Uh, Coach Hammock's career had been cut short by an unfortunate heart condition. He was going into his senior year as an All-American candidate, and unfortunately he had to stop. So he joined our our coaching staff as a graduate assistant and was just a great guy to be around knew how to push you, knew how to work, and totally, could totally tell that he valued relationship. And since then, then he's been on, going on to have a tremendous career. He went back to NIU as a running back coach. He went to Minnesota from 2007 to 2010, came back again to Wisconsin to be eventually end up as the assistant head coach, Coach Bielema, in 2011-2013, coached the likes of Melvin Gordon and James White, then had the opportunity to go to the pros and was the running back coach for the Baltimore Ravens from 2014 to 2018. And just this past season, had the opportunity to come back to his alma mater, take over the reins. So really fun to connect with Coach Hammock. We happened to see each other at a clinic recently and asked if he willing to hop on the podcast, and and he was more than willing. So he's done a great job navigating the difficult waters of how we're all adjusting to life without football and and how they've handled some spring ball stuff. He's got some great recommendations for coaches about how they can – leverage some different tools to help their players stay knowledgeable about the game. So without further ado, Coach Hammock from Northern Illinois. Hey, Coach Hammock, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Joe. Thanks for having me. Excited to be on. Yeah, man, it's as it good. It's been funny to think about how long ago this journey that you and I knew each other started back at Wisconsin when you were starting as a GA after playing. And I think it's awesome that you're now the head coach at Northern Illinois and and that program's in great hands, so I'm glad to have you on. Yeah, no, certainly. I mean, it's been an interesting journey. You know, we're enjoying it as a family, and obviously happy to be at, at my alma mater, NIU, and a place that I feel great about and have a, a deep respect for. Let's talk. Let's jump right in and start talking about the stars of your home team, beginning with your wife. How did you meet this special woman? Well, I met her at NIU. We met on campus freshman year, and we started dating sophomore year, and we've been together ever since. And, and I think it's been it's been a great journey. She's been a great supporter of everything, all my aspirations, and everything that I've I wanted to achieve. She's obviously an excellent mom. Uh, we have two beautiful kids, Thomas and Tierra. My daughter's 11, and my son will be seven in April. So at this time, you know, she's she she's taking the reins of being a teacher. You know, with the time off and Everything yeah. that's going on now, and, and she's doing a great job in that regard. 
Tell me a little bit more about your kids. What are their ages and what makes each of them so special to you? Yes, you know, Tierra, she's my oldest. She'll be turning 11 in, in May. She's a grinder. She's, <laughs> she's, she works hard, extremely hard. You know, she's going to always give her best effort in everything that she does. My son, Thomas, his name is Thomas Douglas, TD. I met okay. my wife in Douglas Hall, and I'll see <laughs> TD. Hopefully, hopefully he can score All some right. touchdowns down the there line. You go. But He's a very smart, skilled young man, and he has a bright future. And just excited about you know both my kids and everything that they got going on. So, coach, I know that after you, you know, your playing days got cut a little bit short, and then you moved into the financial world for for a little bit. What made you want to decide to get back into coaching, and and how did you get that first job at Wisconsin? And maybe what what was your wife or girlfriend at the time thinking about that decision? Well, you know, when you enter the workforce, there's a lot of things you miss about being on the team, uh, the camaraderie, the locker room, the team aspect of, of playing football that I missed. And I, I realized that very, very quickly and reached out to Coach Alvarez and expressed to him, you know, my desire to at least get back and in, involved with the game of football. He called me the next day and said, you know, I'm not sure what I can do for you, but hey, if you come here and work hard, you know, great things can happen. So my wife, my girlfriend at the time, she was working downtown Chicago at Pricewater Coopers, making a lot of money. And I, I left my job at Wells Fargo Financial to make no money. And, you know, once you start doing it for a little bit, you know, coaching becomes your passion and something that you can't, you know, you can't live without. So obviously very fortunate how my career has taken off uh, since that, that key decision, but, but certainly happy about, you know, where we are now. Coach, you, you've moved around a little bit. You know, you've had a chance to be in the college level and then and then get a chance to be in the NFL, now back to NIU. But when you discussed a new job with your wife, what were things that you evaluated together? And I know this most recent one was pretty new, so your daughter was a little bit older. Did you, did you involve your kids at all in the, in the decision-making process? Well, you know, I think any time you make a decision, it becomes a family decision. And this this time, particularly, you know, my, my son and daughter's old enough that they understand, hey, this is really the first time that we moved where they were old enough to really understand what a move was like. And so, you know, when I discussed it with my wife, you know, she always knew if I was going to go back to college, it would only be to go back to NIU. And when that opportunity mm -hmm. presented itself, I, I wanted to make sure I, I took it. And then, but we did have a chance to sit down with our kids and and talk to them and try to explain to them about, hey, we are moving as a family. How do you feel about that? And, and they were 100% on board. It was a very smooth transition. They finished out the school year in Maryland and then obviously came here at the start of the school year last year. Is there anything that you look at now versus the NFL lifestyle and maybe talk to some of us about, you know, what the difference is in terms of timing and some of the freedoms that maybe either schedule allows versus the other one? I know obviously being a head coach versus position coach is, is different and involves a whole lot more, but maybe just kind of discuss some how, the, how that time stuff works out for you guys. Yeah, I mean, you know, the major difference between, you know, college and the pros is recruiting. You know, recruiting is something that, you know, you're heavily involved with all year round. So, it's something you, you know, it's like shaving. You have to do it one. You have to do it every day. Otherwise, <laughs> you you can you can get in bad shape. But yep. th that's the major that's the major difference with the two that I, that I see. As far as the season, the season is the season. But the pro season is, is extremely long. By the time you add in preseason and playoffs, you, you're looking at a situation where you playing twenty twenty one twenty two games in a, in a year, uh, which is you know obviously a five six month season. So. You know, when the season ended this year uh, at NIU, I was like, is that it? Because obviously <laughs> you've done, you know, you've done around Thanksgiving as right. opposed to having, you know, five or six more weeks left in the season. So the length of the season is, is, is one major difference. I think the off season, you know, obviously different for various reasons. But both levels have pros and cons. And, you know, we're ex extremely happy about where we're at and what we're building here at NIU. So consistency and discipline is a big thing in parenting, just like it is on the football, any football program. With being apart from you got your wife, maybe as much as you are and your kids, how do you guys communicate and deal with discipline issues with your kids? My wife, I think, is a, is a lot harder than I am. So I don't worry about, <laughs> you know, my kids when I'm not around because they are in excellent hands. So she, she, she runs a tight ship, especially academically. And, you know, my kids have been in front of from that.
Coach, your kids are now at the age where, you know, they have the potential to hear some information or negative press and in social media and whatever the case may be. How do you and your wife work to combat the potentially negative, you know, social media fans that your kids are inevitably going to run into? Yeah, you know, they they haven't dealt with it as much. You know, last season I did get off of Facebook. I mean, it's just okay. one of those things where, you know, people could just, you know, feel free to say whatever they need to say to you, which I didn't agree with. If, if you have something to say, you can get my number. You can right. come see me. So really the only social media I'm on right now is Twitter. And obviously yep. that's for recruiting purposes. So we, we I think we do a good job shielding them away from, you know, that that aspect of the job. Yeah. I try not to bring work home too often. When your daughter, you know, your daughter was an older when you were in Baltimore, was there any, did, did people know that you were a coach? Did, did her friends know? I mean, parents were everyone pretty much understanding how the NFL can sometimes carry a little bit more you know, fanfare with everyone in the community versus a college town or, or, you know, any issues there? You know, the interesting thing is when you work for a pro organization, a lot of times you're in a big city. So, you know, a a couple of people knew that I was a coach, but for the most part, you know, you can go to restaurants, you can go out and and people, you kind of just blend it in with everybody else, which was one of the, you know, perks of being in the NFL as opposed to a, a college town. You know, everybody's going to know you, know who you are, know who you work for. In pro towns, pro cities, um, you can kind of fly under the radar a lot of times. Okay. Unless you're John Harbaugh. There you go. (laughs) Very true. Very true. The next series of questions we'll call clock management and how you spend your time to blend family and football. Coach, this has obviously been a a really interesting time in in our world right now where guys are in the football world are pretty much shut down. Kids are going home, doing online classes, things like that. What recommendations have you given to your coaches to do during this time in terms of, you know, taking care of what they got to take care of at home and also still being accountable to football? Yeah, no, we we have an outline of of things that we need to get done from a football standpoint. But what I explained to my staff is you you have to work where you feel comfortable. If that's home, if that's somewhere else, you know, you know what you need to get done. You know the time frame of, of when things need to get done. And I, I have to trust you guys as men and as my staff to – go out there and, and, and get it done. And so I have a schedule of everybody's plan for the next six weeks, what they're doing mm-hmm. daily, and we'll just stick with those plans and uh, you know, as well as let them you know, have time to spend time with their family as well. Coach, you're in charge of the hiring process. You knew what guys you wanted to bring on board and things like that. How much do you evaluate a, a guy you know, in their family life when you're bringing them on to your staff to see how they can all blend together with the guys you currently have on board and you know, what sort of things are maybe you looking for character-wise to make sure you got the right guy in-house, you know, that has the right values that, uh, in terms of how they value their family? Yeah, excellent question. I think, you know, sometimes in, in the hiring process, you know, you, you, you try to get a feel for the person. Are they married? Do they have kids? Obviously, that shows a, a level of responsibility, a level of commitment to doing things right. You know, you try to ask different questions to get a feel for a, a coach as a person, as a husband, as a man, I think th- those things are important. And But obviously, you know, until you work with somebody, you really don't have the full extent of who that guy is, you know, in moments of adversity and moments of pressure. How is he going to respond? So what you do is you try to make the best decisions possible based on the information that you have. And that's what we try to do with the hiring process. Coach, you've seen a lot of guys, you know, in a lot of different places coach different ways and, and manage their hours different ways. Any recommendations for for guys around the country on how, you know, how you stay connected with your kids on a weekly basis despite the long hours and things that you've seen work well? Yeah, I think the the one thing a coach gave me advice is is that, you know, when you're home, you're 100% committed to your family. And I think, you know, no matter how much time that is, the time that you, you, you do have – uh, make it worthwhile, and and that's what we try to do. We try to, you know, make sure we plan vacations and take them different places and experience different things, knowing that you know your time will be limited. So, uh, you, you obviously feel guilty at times being a coach and how much time it takes. But you know, when you're home or when you're around your kids, you're 100% committed to them. What are things you try to do with the staff and families at NIU to make sure the families know that they're welcomed around the building and the practices and things like that? Yeah, you know, we have family dinners on Sundays after games, win, lose, or draw. I was on a staff where they said we wanted to have family dinners 
and you lose a couple games and they stop the family dinner. So uh, we, we made sure, uh, you know, uh, it's the truth. So yeah. I explained to my staff, you know, last season, I said, if we, if we start this, you know, we are going to do this, win, lose, or draw. You know, yep. where it's not going to be a situation where, hey, we lost a conference game and then all of a sudden now your family can't come and eat with you on, on Sunday. So I said, no matter yep. what, if we start it, we're going to, we're going to finish this because you can't adjust things because, you know, your children don't understand, your wife yep. don't understand why, why are things changing because you lost the game. So, right. you know, we have family dinners. Obviously kids are always welcome to practice and they come around. We really yep. tried to get our families involved in the recruiting process, bringing them yep. up to unofficial visits, official visits, uh, having our kids around. You know, we did a select junior day where it was basically fun and games with our family with the recruits, and I, and and those okay. those guys had a had an excellent time interacting with our family and and getting to know us on a more personal level, and I think that's important. And I think with, with my team, I've had you know our whole team over to my house for dinner. And, and my kids and my wife entertained them when they came over. And I think, you know, doing things like that, you know, getting people to know you on a personal level brings you closer, but makes you a tighter team, a team that, you know, better prepared to deal with any adversity that may come your way. Absolutely. I think that's a wonderful idea to, to bring those families involved. And, you know, it's great to see, you know, yeah, you wear Nike shoes or Adidas shoes or whatever, but, you know, it's good to know who you're going to be a part of. And I'm sure parents on um, how important do you think that day is for parents just to see you, to know that their their kids go in the right place for family truly is important? Well, I think I think it's it's critical. You you walk in people's homes and say, I'm gonna look after your your son and right. really I have to look at, at after them no different than I will look after my own son. And I think that's important. So just like my son is in my house, how can I how can I have a house and not have my players over to the house? You know, no building doubt. those relationships. As a head coach, you know, if if one of your assistants has something that's important for his family that he needs to attend, how do you guys communicate that? And, and does a guy know that he has freedom to leave and, you know, kind of negotiate those things as, as they come up with families? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's obviously a case-by-case basis, but they know it's, it was something that's extremely important. If you need to be at, just ask him. You know, I haven't I haven't told the coach no to this point. Sure. So I think if somebody feels it's important to to, to run it by me, then I think obviously I got to give it the same same amount of respect. Do you think there's a change in that culture where more guys are now willing to have those discussions with their head coaches? And I kind of feel like you know I hate to say when I was playing, but and like it's that long ago, but. I feel like kind of had to be there, or else. I feel like that culture is shifting a lot of places, or you think it's still yeah. I think I think the mentality places. the mentality of people have have changed, right? Things yep. when when you played, just think you know when you played some of the things that were maybe said to you or done to you or whatever. Yep. You 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 yep. can <laughs> those things can't happen in in today's society. Um, right. So you have to adjust adjust with the times. You have to adjust with how people are here and now, and I think. You have to be open to, you know, different experiences. I think you have to be open to a coach saying, hey, you know, my daughter has a recital. You have to be open to that if you right. want people to respect you and, and want to work for you, which is which is obviously what you want as a head coach. Yeah. Do you think it creates a drive for guys to want to be certain places versus somewhere else? Like they – Yeah, you know, and, and, that's what I, and that's what I tell guys. You know, when guys say, hey, they, they looking at other opportunities, I said, well – you know what, that opportunity may pay you more, but yep. you won't be more happy. And I think, right. you know, that's, that's a big selling point for me. I'm never going to stop anyone from, you know, doing something that they think is better for them and their families. But at the same right. time, you want to make it a, a working environment that's conducive for guys, you know, enjoying to, to come to work every day. Yeah. How do you, as a coaching staff, I think the one thing that you know, we look at and joke about, whoever has the marker last wins, Sometimes, you you know, I listen to a great podcast, but, you know, what if they do this? How do you, you and your staff work to prevent what I call chasing ghosts in the game plan? Yes. And yeah. so that you can minimize the time that, you know, you basically eliminate the unnecessary meeting time. Correct. Well, I think a lot of a lot of it has to deal with you. You have to work off the percentages, right? If 80 percent of the time they, they are in this defense and this coverage, you know, you, you can't plan for the 20% all the time. Now, if you can get some of those 
auxiliary defenses or looks in throughout the course of the week, but you have to build a system that can handle curveballs, right? You yeah. know, the, the, is your protection flexible enough that if they don't bring bring this exact blitz, can you still pick it up, or do you still right. have an answer? So what we try to provide is, you know, we want to make sure our, our players have enough tools in the toolbox that no matter what they show you or, or what look they may give you this week, we have an answer. And and a big thing, you know, obviously if you're playing a four-down team versus a three-down team, right, that's always a big right. one. Right? You play a four-down yep. team, they jump into the three-down, what are you going to do? So we try to make sure our systems, offense, defense, and special teams has enough tools in it where, hey, if we get to the sideline, we can make a quick adjustment and get everybody on the same page. No doubt. Coach, if you could just address real quick, what are you – I'm going to give some suggestions. You and me at the high school level, what are your players doing to stay engaged right now, even though they're not on campus and not going to be able to do spring ball? What are things that you guys have put in place that maybe other programs around the country could do to help themselves? Well, what we did, we, we, we spent the week putting everything into a video library. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, we built a, a, a video playbook. We built video installs with coaches installing uh, segments, offense, defense, special teams. We built voiceovers with colors from last season where we show on the tape and then, you know, we're talking over the tape. And the, the great thing is all this stuff can be done with a phone. You don't have yep. to have a, a big video department. You can have a phone recording a huddle and talking over it and then send it out to the players. So sure. we spent a week straight working on all those things. And so now what we're doing with our players is they have responsibilities to watch two of those cut-ups per week is in order. And then we obviously going to do – we got virtual meetings. We use in Zoom which is a free yep. app. It's an excellent program. And so, actually, I got a Zoom meeting here in a minute coming up. Okay. Um, but, yep. and, and me as the head coach, I, I've been involved in all of these meetings, so I, I can see what the coaches are installing, how the players are interacting. Because the one thing that, you know, is important is you don't want the players to feel isolated. You don't you don't want the, the players to feel like they don't have nobody to talk to. And with mental health and all these different things, uh, we want to make sure we have a bunch of different ways to touch the players. And then the other thing we're doing with our, with our strength coach is he's making workout videos and sending them to the players where they can have a chance to, you know, get some at-home workouts in as well. So, you know, we've tried to be proactive during this time and, and get our players in a spot where they feel like they can uh, have a chance to continue to stay engaged for as long as this thing goes. So coach, I'm going to move to the last set of questions. Is there, you know, can you share one of the struggles maybe you've had to overcome as a family or you've seen another coach overcome during your career and what lessons other coaches can learn from it? Well, I think I think the struggle is always the time management. You know, how much time are you spending with your kids? When, you, when, you, when you're home, are you engaged with what they're doing? You know, do I stay another hour at work or, or go home? I mean, there's always those things that you deal with constantly, and I think you got to continue to, find creative ways to, you know, get around your kids because I think that's important. Coach, how do you, you know, a lot of guys, like you said, hey, I have I have a guys over for a meal, but but how do you make your players feel valued outside of what they can do for you on the field? Like, how do you make them know, like, hey, I still got you, even if you're not a guy for us on the field? Yeah, I think the, the most important thing is, you know, we spend a lot of time with our players having nine football meetings. Okay. And to to me, what what that does is allow you to break the the barriers down and get to know the young men as people, get to know some of their struggles, get to you know understand and respect them, and and vice versa. They get a chance to understand and respect you outside of football. You know, you you hate for a guy to always come over, and the first thing you talk about is, hey, you you messed up on this blitz, or you messed up on this right. run, or you messed up on this. So it has to be yep. some level of balance. Where you know we spend time getting to know them as people and building those relationships outside of football, and I think that's important. So if a guy's not playing, he's he's not unhappy because he's not he's not playing. He understands, hey, I'm not playing because maybe I'm not good enough. But at right. the, at the same time, the coaches are still going to treat me with respect. They're still going to treat me the right way, and not try to run me off the program. I think that's important. 
Okay. Coach, the last question I have for you is a question I call victory formation. And and really, it boils down to what what legacy or impact are you striving to create through coaching that maybe you couldn't do in any other profession? Yeah, obviously, we're trying to develop men, men of character, men of discipline, men of accountability. And that's how we base our program. We want young men uh, to walk out of this program better because they was a part of our program. And I think you don't get a chance to do that in any other profession where you have a chance to change people's lives. You have a chance to change the direction of their lives based on how you handle yourself, how you present yourself, how you handle adversity. You know, last season was an excellent example. You know, we didn't win as many games as we wanted to win, but my demeanor and my approach remained unchanged throughout the whole season. And when we had our senior day, the seniors said, you need to continue doing what you're doing because you're doing it the right way, and these young men can learn from that. And that's what you have an opportunity to do as a coach. That's awesome. Well, it's good to know those guys got can see the value of it, even though the, the wins and loss column didn't maybe reflect where they, they wanted to be. But it's neat when a group of kids that age can see that the future is going to be bright for that next group of kids. And, and obviously, they led help lead the way for that. Appreciate it. Coach, thank you so much for your time. We look forward to, to, to keeping an eye on you in the future and wish you nothing but the best of luck this upcoming year. Thanks, Joe. Coaches, again, want to remind you of what we're doing with the football development model. Please push this down to your youth coaches. I think this is a great way for you to get some organization and structure beyond what you've already done. Uh, check it out, all of our, our program development for youth football at fdm.usafootball.com. Again, check out our systems for blocking, tackling, and defeating blocks at footballdevelopment.com. If you register with your email, you get your choice of three free videos. There's some great things in there. I think things that as you get going again, you can get into the summer and maybe make up on some things that you might have lost if you had a spring ball, if you had time here in the spring to work on football. Some great drills for all those phases of contact. If you're enjoying the podcast, please have it over to iTunes or your platform and give us a five-star rate. If you have a minute, write a review. We really appreciate it, and we will read your review on our highlight show that we do at the end of the week.